Thanks. Thanks, Mike. We'll yeah, disconnected. it's okay. Without further ado. Okay, this talk may sound boring because it's medicine, not surgery, but it's so important because without this, you're not giving your patients everything they need to know. I'll just hold it here. Please understand the Norwood pattern. If you don't understand how hair is lost, you won't know how to surgically or medically restore it. It's so important to see how things progress. Okay. This is the issue. It, you may have a good surgical outcome, but the problem is you're dealing with a situation of ever losing supply, donor supply, if you're harvesting and, and moving uh, hair forward, for example, or just losing it because you're losing hair around the supply zone, and you're ever increasing demand. So it's a losing situation. So what medicine does is it helps turn the tables a little bit back and stabilize those hairs that are being lost. What does stabilization mean? This slide is the easiest way to understand androgenic alopecia or male pattern baldness, which are the same terms, is that we go from thick hairs to thin, vellus baby hairs, wispy, thin, short hairs before they disappear. So medicine is working at the level of the vellus hair to bring some of it back toward terminal. Once it goes here, it's hard to bring it back. So this is why it's important to sl slow down this progression and bring some of this back and think of like a chemistry equation sort of this equilibrium going back and forth the more you can push it this way before it comes here is what medicine does so medicine really makes your surgical results look better uh, helps patients that may not be safe surgical candidates which we'll talk about more during this uh, during this weekend it's really really important so what are the two FDA cleared medications that are available it's finasteride and minoxidil and Minoxidil has been around for a long time, since 88. And 97 is when finasteride came around. So it's, these are old standing drugs, and they're both off patents, so they're, they're both generic now. Minoxidil comes in 2% for women and 5% for men. Finasteride is only cleared for men. So it's really more effective when, when you have that early hair loss. So when you have that younger gentleman coming in that's losing hair, this is the way to think about it. Don't just jump to surgery because if you put a great surgical result on a young patient and that patient ages, that result could be exposed because all the hairs that are transplanted are still there, but everything around it has disappeared and they can look weird because they don't follow that Nord pattern that we talked about. And so please look at that pattern. Um, the big negative of taking these medications and something the patients need to know is that if you stop taking it, you lose everything you gain during the time you're on it. Now you don't lose more, but you lose everything that you, you stabilize. Let's say you take it for five years and you would have lost this much hair. If you stop five years later, you will have slowly receded back to where you started, which is a disappointing thing. But it's one of those things that I think it's so important to uh, tell, tell patients both pros and cons of every decision they make. And the other thing that's important, these are not redundant. These are synergistic. They work together to get a better result. So think of that slide, the big terminal hairs, to vellus hairs, to no hairs, that progression is the way that you encapsulate this entire thinking and you help a patient understand it. I usually use a thumb, a small finger, and zero and get that into the patient's brain so they understand this. So let's talk a little about minoxidil. This is over the counter. It's a topical medication. Uh, sometimes patients, when they start using this, they see at four to six weeks a little bit of shedding because the hairs are moving into a growth phase. And I tell the patients that's not bad. We don't know exactly how this uh, product works. It's some maybe vascular um, improvement. Maybe it's a potassium channel agonist. There's so many ways that people have thought about how this works. But it does work in almost all patients, not every patient, but the gross majority of patients it works. So this is something that I really encourage you to understand in detail, both how it works, why it works, and how you can implement it for your patients. Um, it comes in two varieties. There's a foam which is just off the patent, and there is a liquid. They both work the same. They're both equally effective, so I don't want you to think one is better than the other. The benefit of the foam is that it doesn't have the uh, propylene glycol, which is about a 23% incidence of der uh, allergic dermatitis, so that's why it's good to use that one if someone has an issue with the liquid, but the liquid is less expensive. It's supposed to be used twice a day, but as far as I know, it has a very long half-life of almost a day, so sometimes patients can use it just once a day. So what I try to tell my patients with this is just try to use it, because a lot of people say, you know, they have this all-in-none proposition. If I can't use it twice a day, I'm not going to use it. 
Well, can you do, use it once a day? Well, sort of. Well, could you use it every other day? You know, obviously the less you use it, the less effective, but I'd rather someone be on it three times or four times a week than, and forget a few days than to say, well, I, I was too sloppy, I couldn't do it twice a day. Try to have the patients do it. I think it's so important for them to do it that, that they should be encouraged to um, use this. The other sort of misthinking of, of this product is that it only works in the crown because, as you probably know, the FDA clears it for an indication, but it really works in a lot of places. So I tell patients to actually double or triple the, the amount that's on the package insert and place it across the entire scalp because it works in the temporal area, works in the frontal hairline, it works in the, this area called the lateral hum, so it works in the crown, it works everywhere. So try to use it everywhere if possible. In women, uh, if, even at 2%, they can get secondary hair growth. What, what's happening there is that uh, there, it's not that they actually drip some of it. It actually gets absorbed in the blood and they can create a little secondary hair growth. Obviously, if, uh, they can use a 2 or 5%, but the 5% is indicated for men. Why use a 5%? It can sometimes more rapidly grow or stabilize hairs, at least in the first year for women. So some people, and, and, and right now, as far as I know, the 5% is only in, uh, is, sorry, the foam is, only comes at 5%. So if they have an easier styleability with the foam, they may want to use the uh, 5%. But really, the, they can use, they really should be using 2%, which is what the FDA indication is for. And again, this is good for both men and women, the, the, the uh, Rogaine foam. The other thing point is I, I want to mention before I forget is that both of these medicine, medicines, besides stabilizing and slowing down hair loss, they can be used for another indication, which is that when I see a patient with a lot of these miniaturized vellus hairs and I'm moving into surgery for them, and I'm worried that if I put some hairs there, the trauma of my putting hairs in there can, can shock out a lot of loss. Uh, and make them look thinner afterwards. I use it, I'll say, you know what, this person, I think I better put them on some medicine for a few months to maybe nine months to a year before, and see what it does, first of all, to see if it may regrow enough hair that they don't need surgery. But in addition to that, it can potentially limit the chance that they can have shedding afterwards. I always tell patients that it's not a guarantee, but it may help them. And in the case that I go, this person's highly miniaturized, a lot of these baby hairs, I probably will take a step back and say, okay, let's, let's, not, um, uh, let's not do surgery today. Let's just wait a few minutes. So that's another thing you should think about is using it in support with hair restoration or transplant surgery, in addition to just as a standalone or as, uh, as an adjunct. And I encourage you, if any of these things don't make sense, please come and, and ask me. This is very hard to communicate so much information in a short time. Finasteride uh, is not over the counter, it's a prescription. It comes in one milligram uh, and five milligrams. It actually just became generic for the one milligram. The five milligram proscar is for prostates and the one milligram is for, um, is for hair loss. And they, you do not need five milligrams for hair loss. One milligram is sufficient in the studies they've shown. So some people uh, still want to save more money and, and, and I'm not advocating this or anything, but you can cut the, the five milligram into smaller uh, like quarters or halves to make it closer to one milligram uh, to, to, to use one milligram. And Propecia is the brand name uh, by Merck for the one milligram dosing if you get the brand version. How does this work? It's a dihydrotestosterone blocker, so it blocks the conversion of testosterone to DHT. Um, through a, it's through an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, so it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And as I said, I want to just uh, mention again, it's synergistic with minoxidil, so that's very, very important information. It takes a little longer to work, somewhere between 3 to 12 months compared to minoxidil, which is maybe 3 to 6 months in terms of the benefit, but it's, it's very, very effective. And just like minoxidil, you can see a little bit of hair shedding as that hairs are moving into the antigen growth phase. So if the patients notice some shedding with any of these treatments, don't panic, it's normal. And I say this right when I prescribe it and right when I talk to them about it. Uh, in the initial studies by Merck, they showed 3.8% uh, versus 2.1% placebo side of, sexual side effect profile. And, uh, but they found that after one month, 57% of those people that continued had uh, reversal of those side effects and they, they dissipated. We'll talk more about side effects in a second. The, there, it can be teratogenic in the male fetus and the, and the genitalia for a woman that handles crushed pills. So that's something important. So a woman shouldn't be taking finasteride. 
there, I'm not going to get into um, some people you, that use uh, off-label use for you know postmenopausal or sterile women using finasteride. It's it's not clear whether it's efficacious, but for the sake of a beginner intermediate course, I think it's important just to emphasize finasteride is for med for men. Okay, this is uh, not for women because you are taking finasteride. Remember, if a woman gets pregnant, she can have a problem uh, taking the medication. So you you cannot donate blood with this. It does alter your testosterone levels. Some agencies consider it could be blood doping, so it could raise your testosterone, it could lower it. There's been changes in, in regulation regarding this. Uh, it does get processed through the liver, so people that have liver disease need to know that that's a, that can be a problem. And uh, there's about a 47% reduction in prostate-specific antigen, or PSA. So someone that's moving up to the window of, let's say, 55, 60 years old, maybe they need ProScar instead, uh, at least ch check a baseline PSA. Now, the thing that's in the news all the, over the place, on the internet, everywhere, is it uh, started from June 2011, an article in Journal of Sexual Medicine that really wasn't a scientific article. I want to emphasize this to you. This was not a study. This was just a telephone interview where they interviewed about 71 males between 21 to 46, and they found that um, they had very long-lasting sexual, uh, permanent sexual side effects, quote-unquote, uh, and it's over, over a three-month three period that didn't reverse out. Um, one thing that's interesting is that, uh, so I, I've had one patient that's complained of this and I've prescribed thousands of prescriptions of finasteride. I'm not saying it can or does not occur, uh, but I do have patients write, uh, sign out a very long um, uh, consent form that says I've told them all the side effects that can occur before I prescribe it just because we live in a litigious society here. There is something that was interesting I learned at the ICHRS both last year and this year, something called the nocebo effect. What this, what this is is like the opposite of the placebo effect. If you tell a person they can have sexual side effects from uh, finasteride, they can just have it. Even if you give them a placebo, they're like, wait a second, I have sexual side effects. You just took a placebo. So that's called a nocebo effect. So it's something that I'm not trying to discount the, the men that are suffering from long-term sexual side effects, but something is important you know when you discuss it with a, a patient. Um, breast cancer is something that they've talked about, but there have been eight cases out of like 29,000 uh, patients, five of whom had the finasteride and three of whom did not have it. So it's, very, it's not statistically significant, but it's in the package insert because of this. Prostate cancer, at a five milligram dosing, there are a couple of trials, the uh, PCPT, uh, prostate cancer prevention trial, and the reduced trial using dutasteride, which is beyond the scope of this talk, uh, which is another type of uh, DHT blocker type 1 and 2, and they found that there was a 23 to 25 percent reduction in low-grade prostate cancer, but there could have been an increase in higher Gleason scale, which is a, uh, which is a scale for higher prostate um, uh, uh, aggressiveness, the cancer aggressiveness of 7 to 10. But then there's a question, is it because it, the, 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 the medicine decreased the prostate size uh, that led to the higher incidence of the higher grade cancers, it's unclear, but at least at the one milligram dosing, I believe it's something that's not uh, really been borne out. These are the five milligram studies, uh, as I was mentioning, where the 0 0.5 milligram dutasteride study. S depression can occur. There was a study uh, by Rahimi and Ardabelli that was uh, 128 men that showed that there c could be a link to depression, but not to anxiety. These are things that, that are just out there, and it's all in my consent form, and unfortunately, I tell patients a lot of these things so that they at least are fully aware, although some of the stuff is, in my opinion, off the record, a bit overblown. The other thing is just under thinking about camouflaging products, and we, we forget this. We say, hey, we talk about medicine, 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 but we forget that, hey, you know what, another good thing is to put some uh, different types of products. There's Topic, Dermatch, uh, Nanogen, different types of products, and, and now you can actually, with these magnetic wool fibers, have a hair spray in there that locks in the fibers so they don't drip everywhere if it gets wet, and some of them claim that only 10% come out when you're swimming. So especially young men who are desperate, I take that little powder out, I put it on there, they go, oh my God, this is great. So that's a great compliment to medicine and to surgery. And also, let's say they're after surgery and they start to shed a lot. And they go, oh my God, I can't go in public. You put the thing on there, they go, wow, this is great. So this is a good alternative and a good supplement to both medicine and to surgery. So you're going to hear a lot of lectures uh, that I'm going, to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about. Some people are going to talk about. I'm going to be talking about these other two modalities, uh, I think, on Saturday. Uh, or th maybe tomorrow, which are going to be yeah, uh, tomorrow, which are going to be laser technologies and platelet-rich plasma and A cell, which are different uh, methods of regenerative medicine 
that I believe are good supplements. So these are things just to introduce. I talk about these five things to especially young patients who may not be surgical candidates so that I can help them. So don't forget, is my point of this, that there's other treatments than just surgery. And what is in the future? Well, we always talk about hair cloning. There's Bimatoprost, which is, you know, right now is Latisse, that, that uh, Allergan, the company, is going through some FDA trials for that to see if that will help with uh, hair loss. A colleague of mine actually uses it mixed with Rogaine. He says it works amazingly well, but that's off the record again, just an anecdotal experience. Histogen is a, is a, um, it's a, it's a product I use actually topically uh, for skin that right now is extremely early, and I don't believe there's any uh, data that could do anything, uh, but that's, that's probably what the future has. So that's a quick talk on medical management. I want to go through how hair grows.